This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the Book of Lamentations. This is session number 14, Lamentations chapter 5, verses 17 through 22. We come now to the closing section of Lamentations chapter 5, namely verses uh, 17 through 22. And we've now come to uncharted territory in comparison with the rest of the book. And we might say, oh no, we can feel at home here. We've got a prayer lament. Uh, we've recognized the, uh, the, the, the petition Uh, The petitions in verse 21, restore us to yourself, renew our days as of old, in line with uh, verse 1, remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Uh, We can recognize uh, verse 19, the uh, affirmation of faith, the affirmation of trust. Uh, You, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures uh, to all generations. And uh, we could even include 17 to 18 as a short description of crisis, uh, such as one does find in in a prayer lament. We said here the two, that 17 to 18 went together with that whole section before, long section, beginning in verse 2, and that it was a a description of, of a funeral lament uh, now concerning the, the occupation. But uh, the, the, there's such a, a switch here at the end of verse 16, and we seem to be starting again with verse 17. And we've, we've got this build-up, this new build-up, because of this, because of these things, because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate in verse 18. And we turn to a new topic, and we go back now, We've forgotten the uh, occupation, uh, so far as the, the text goes. And the congregation are looking round and remembering that they're in that ruined city, uh, that ruined court of the uh, Jerusalem temple, I think. And uh, the, the, there it is. They've gone back to this whole thing about this, this general disaster which had befallen them which had uh, culminated in the ruin of Jerusalem and the destruction of the uh, temple. And so there's very much a new start. And so I think that 17 and 18, we can align more with a psalm lament and the comparatively brief description of crisis that we find there. And it's this demarcation. Uh, with this new introduction in 17, because of, because of, because of, that uh, the hint is there that we're starting again with a a psalm lament situation. But there's something we've left out. We have not adequately explained the text in terms of a a, a psalm lament, Uh, because this is a different ballgame now, from most of the uh, prayer laments in the, from many of the uh, uh, prayer laments in in the Psalms. And it's the negativity of verses 20 and 22. Why have you forgotten us completely? Why have you forsaken us these many days? And then verse 22, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. And uh, there are two types of psalm lament. And uh, when we've spoken of psalm laments earlier uh, in relating to the text, it's been uh, the general psalm lament, uh, which is rejecting to a crisis and asking for, for God's help. But that won't take us all the way where this ending of the Book of Lamentations is concerned. And... Uh, and now we, we, we have to look further and to recognize that here we have a subtype of the Psalms of Lament. And we briefly introduced this uh, when we were talking about the relationship of the Psalms to Lamentations at the be- beginning, very beginning of our video course. But now we've got to look into it uh, more exactly. And there's a great book which uh, was uh, written Uh, by a man called Craig Broyles. 
and it's called The Conflict of Faith and Experience in the Psalms. And what that book does is to look at psalms which correspond to the ending of Lamentations 5. And uh, he, he told us that there are 65 psalm laments, and 44 of those are, are general psalm laments, but 21 belong to a subtype, uh, which we can call psalms of complaint. And here it's not complaint about a human situation merely, and uh, complaint against human enemies and, and how one is suffering in a human way, but it's complaint against God, psalms of complaint against God. And there are uh, 21 examples in the book of Psalms. And this is a resource that is now claimed in this congregational prayer. Uh, one third of the laments in the Psalms belong to this type, complaining to God about God, both communal laments and individual l laments. And in fact, they are, they are uh, marked uh, by two questions. And sometimes it's just one question and sometimes it's both questions. And we can look at, um, at Psalm uh, 74, for instance, and what do we find there? Well, we find this question, why? Uh, in verse 1 of Psalm 74, O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your uh, pasture? That double why. And of course, we've got a double why in verse 20. Why have you forgotten us completely? Why have you forsaken us these many days? So that's Psalm 74 in verse 1. Uh, and then in verse 11 of Psalm 74, why do you hold back your hand? Why do you keep your hand in, in your bosom? And I think I had occasion to, to, to mention that verse when we were introducing these psalms of uh, complaint, but now we can see the parallelism, this double why that we had in 74.1 and 74.11. But alongside that, in verse 10, how long, O God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? How long? How long? And when we were introducing these uh, psalms of complaint much earlier in our video course, we said that this why is, is not a seeking for information, but it's a why of protest and a why of bewilderment. And this uh, how long is saying, it's all too much, enough already, we cannot cope anymore. Well, we have the double why, we don't actually have the how long, but it, it's there in spirit in that second line in, in verse, uh, second half line in verse 20. Why have you forsaken us these many days? It's all been too long, God. We, we, we just can't take any more. And we might ask a general question. Why, why should there be a complaint against God in this particular situation? And... Uh, it, it's pretty clear, it's, it's pretty obvious uh, from the, uh, the content of Lamentations that much of it is concerned with looking back and the psychological grief that has come from that past situation of that siege uh, of, of, of Jerusalem, 18 long months and the suffering that that meant for the people who were cooped up in that capital city. Uh, but ha having, having said that, th there's this movement uh, in chapter 3 uh, in a minimal way and in chapter 5 in a maximal way of speaking about a post-war situation. And so what had been engrossing the uh, mentor's attention and also the congregation's hearts earlier on, that's not the end of it. That's not the end of it. But there's more, there's more, there's more. And it's all carrying on in a terrible way. This objective gr grief, this objective grounds for their grief, it, it's still happening in this harassment that they're finding. And they just can't take it anymore. And so we can understand this enough already. You know, that was bad enough. But it, it just seems to carry on and on, this uh, objective suffering of ours. And we can't take it anymore. And so it, it seems very, very reasonable that that should uh, be uh, happening, in, in, in fact. 
All right. Is there anything more that we should say in general about these psalms of complaint? Yes. What were the particular complaints that you find of in, in find in the psalms? Well, I, I, I'll just give some some general answers with, without specific references. God has failed to answer long and fervent praying. God is absent when he's most needed. God is present, but only as a negative force. The believer is likely to die and have his relationship with God terminated. The suffering involves humiliation, and this makes it too much, or it's otherwise excessive. And, and so the, these are, are various reasons that, that, that come to, to the fore, and uh, a number of them we can fancy as being echoed uh, in spirit uh, behind this, uh, behind this uh, com complaint element, complaining against God. And so we find 17 to 22, these closing verses, they contained important clues about the genre. And we can see it's not merely a psalm of lament as we thought it might be from verse 1 with these petitions to God, but as it, we analyze how it turns out as it comes back to prayer, as it comes back to a more obviously prayer lament form, we see that it's, uh, it's uh, following a particular model, this subtype of complaint against God. And so this helps us to do uh, justice to the exegesis before us because we can find parallels for what's being said in, in, in the Psalms. And let me say, as I was saying uh, at the beginning of our uh, course, that there are these traditions that the uh, congregation and the mentor can take hold of and make use of to help them through their sufferings. And we have to ask whether there are sufficient tradition uh, sufficient traditions in our own uh, Christian uh, history and fellowship uh, to enable us to get through? And I think very often the answer is no. Well, we'll come back to the general notion of protest and complaint to God, what I like to call challenge. God is being challenged here. We'll come back to it when we've done our general exegesis. Verses 17 and 18 very much go together. Uh, commentators are not at all sure. It seems to me pretty clear, and there are commentators who say the same, that 17 and 18 go together. And it's this, uh, it's this repeated style of this preposition. Because of this, our hearts are sick. Because of these things, our, heart, our eyes have grown dim. Then a colon. What is it? because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate. And so there's a carryover between 17 and 18 with the repetition of, of that, uh, that preposition there. And uh, so it, it's clear, but we've got this careful introduction to this new theme, this new element, which in Lamentations is an old element, the, the desolation of Mount uh, Zion. And so this and these things, they seem to be looking forward uh, to verse 18, uh, pretty obviously. And the, the NIV takes the same line. Uh, because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate. But it lets us down because it should have repeated that preposition in the Hebrew, which is just the same, but the NRSV uh, is, is better at this point. Because of, because of, because of Mount Zion. And we, we, we come to the point. And so there's this looking forward, looking forward. What is it? What is it? And at last we come in, uh, in verse uh, uh, 18. But before we come to that, we, 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 we've got to look at it, and um, there's, there's a, a sentiment of grief here, isn't there? Because of this, our hearts are sick. That sickness of heart is that, is that grief that's being felt. And because of this, our eyes have, have grown dim. This is uh, an, an idiom that we, we don't, I think, use ourselves. And what we have to realize is that um, in the Old Testament, the, the eyes can be the organs of psychological 
perception and, can re uh, and here in this case it can refer to a failure to understand. We're virtually blind. And that word blind, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, is used in a, in a sort of a spiritual sense of having understanding from God's point of view as to what's going on. Uh, but we, 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 we don't um, uh, use this, this particular idiom uh, of, of our eyes be, being uh, dim. Uh, we, we, we have got an, uh, an, an opposite um, uh, metaphor. We, we can speak of, of somebody being uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and there's somebody who's, who's fully up to what's going on. And I think it includes that one has a full understanding. One can fully cope with what's going on, in fact. We, we sometimes talk of a sight for sore eyes, and, and perhaps sore eyes are the equivalent of dim eyes here. All right, and so it's our failure to understand what, what, what's going on, what's going on. And this lack of understanding, it does pave the way for the uh, expression of complaint. We don't understand what's going on. And so why, why, uh, in, in, in verse 20, uh, it very much expresses this, this bewilderment, or already it's uh, hinted at at the end of verse 17. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. And so what is part of an urban area is now a rural area. It's just a wilderness, and it's the haunt of, uh, of animals, wild animals, in fact. There's some uncertainty as to the precise meaning of, uh, of Mount Zion. Earlier, we've only had Zion, uh, which was called a city, right back in chapter 1, and uh, verse 1, how lonely sits the city that once was full of people. And uh, so it, it, it could be the city. But it may be that it, it's differentiated, and there's another exegetical option. It may be it's the Temple Mount, the, 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 the hill on which the temple stood. And perhaps that word mount differentiates. Uh, in the Old Testament generally, uh, a few times, Mount Zion refers to the city of Jerusalem, but many times more, quite a few times more, uh, Mount Zion refers to, to the temple, the temple area, in, in, in fact. Uh, and, and so we're, we're, we're not sure which way to go. It's difficult to decide. But it doesn't affect the overall exegesis very much. Whether it's, if it's the city, it's the city including the temple, uh, or it may be the temple area itself. And we, we, we have to realize if it's the city, but part of the problem was that uh, that capital, that former capital of, of Judah and earlier of, of, all, the, of all Israel, uh, was the capital no longer. The capital had been moved up to uh, Mizpah, uh, eight miles to the north. That was the capital of post-war Judah. And so, yes, uh, how lonely sits the city, uh, said chapter 1 and verse 1. And so it, it's either the city or the city temple. And so this is what's causing the distress because what lies around uh, is so vivid a reminder of the disaster that, that's been suffered. It lies desolate. It lies desolate. And now we come to something, an element, which is important for the whole of Lamentations. It's the uh, Hebrew adjective shamem, uh, which I like to render devastated, devastated. And sometimes it's used in an objective sense, and sometimes it's used in a subjective sense of our feelings, our psychological feelings. And this is, uh, this is a word either in the adjectival form, shamem, or in one case uh, as a uh, verb, uh, which runs all through the book, devastated. And we, we might summarize the situation in terms of devastation. And it, it's so valuable a word because, uh, as in the Hebrew, uh, it covers both uh, ob an objective phenomenon and then the subjective reaction, devastation. 
And uh, I'll just go through the examples. We, we didn't say it before. It's more convenient to uh, put it un under one heading and to deal with it once. And so at the end, it's, uh, it's reasonable to take notice of it. And here it's used of Mount Zion. And this is the, obviously the uh, objective uh, description. Uh, jackals prowl over it. And so this is very much the, 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 the result of, of what had happened. Uh, in an objective sense. But we, we, we had it uh, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in verse 4 of chapter 1. All her gates are desolate. The roads to Zion mourn. No one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate. And there's a, an objective foundation here because the gates have, have, have been ruined. And uh, they're, they're not functioning to keep out the invader, but they, they're collapsed. Uh, but along with, with this, the, it's, there's a metaphor here. The gates are desolate because it's along with the roads to Zion mourning. And so there, there's a metaphor of the subjective sense which overlays that ob objective sense. And so you get a, a delicious combination there. And then in 113, we've got three examples in chapter 1. He has left me stunned. Stunned. It's this word, sh shamem. And here it's the subjective reaction. This is Zion speaking. I'm stunned. I'm devastated by all that's gone on. And then 2, in verse uh, 16, my children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Once again, my, my children... The, those people left behind in Judah and who were meeting for this uh, liturgy, this service. Uh, my children, says Zion, are desolate. And they are, they are devastated. And once again, it's subjective meaning. And then uh, in chapter 3, we've got to wait to chapter 3 and verse uh, 11, where the uh, mentor is uh, giving his first testimony of the uh, crisis, individual crisis that he'd been brought into. Uh, it, he led me off my way and tore me to pieces like a bear or a lion. He's made me desolate, left me devastated. And once again, it's this uh, subjective uh, meaning for that particular word. In, ch in chapter 4, in verse 5, it's not the adjective, but it's a verb associated with it. Those who, lie, who, those who feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. They lie devastated in, in the streets. Uh, that, that was 4, 5, and then lastly, uh, 5, 18. And there's an interesting parallel. Uh, do you remember Tamar, Princess Tamar, uh, the daughter of David? how she was uh, raped by her half-brother Amnon. And uh, the full brother of, uh, of, Tam of, of, of Tamar was, was Absalom. And uh, he came to, to, to where, where, when he heard of it, he very much took Tamar uh, under his wing uh, because she was so devastated. And it's, it's this word in the feminine, Shumema. She had a nervous breakdown that she never got over. And her brother Absalom took her into his own home and looked after her uh, forevermore. And when Absalom came to uh, have a daughter, what name did he give to her? Tamar, his beloved sister, Aunt Tamar. And uh, as a tribute to her, this sister that lived in, in his home. And so there we are. There's a concrete illustration of devastation, this raped woman who could never get over it. And so it's a very powerful word. And it's this word that comes for the last time. Mount Zion is devastated. And so it's a key word in the uh, book. All right. And so we have this, this shocking circumstance, the devastation of Mount Zion and the prowling animals there. And of, of course, this is a great source of, of grief because uh, it cuts across uh, centuries of uh, history and theology and spiritual normality 
because over against that we have Zion theology. All is going to be well. All is going to be well for Zion. And so it, it creates a crisis uh, in terms of expectation and in terms of belief as to where God stood in relation to, to Zion. And so that is a shocking thing in itself. And this is all part of this, uh, this situation that leads to protest and challenge when we come to verse 20. But before we do that, in verse 19, we have an affirmation of faith. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. And as I say, this is an affirmation of trust, such as we generally find in the prayer of lament. But uh, in that subtype, the prayer of challenge, the prayer of complaint against God, it takes on another role. It takes on a persuasive role. This God is what we expect you to be. Why aren't you being it? Reigning forever, your throne enduring to all generations. And uh, there's very much a persuasive element here. And this is, this is uh, very much uh, something that uh, belongs to, uh, to, 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 to Zion uh, theology. But before we, we, we look at that, let, let's look at this uh, element of complaint in, a, in an actual uh, psalm. Uh, psalm 89 is a, a royal psalm of uh, challenging God. And it starts not with an affirmation of faith, but something that's related to it in terms of faith. It starts with a hymn a great hymn about God's power. And it weaves into that hymn of God's power the covenant that was made with David, this everlasting royal dynasty based on David's line. And the royal speaker says, ah, but it all's come to nothing, hasn't it? You made these great promises. And we have this hymn uh, celebrating your power but there's a, a terrible but in verse 38. But now you have spurned and rejected him. You are full of wrath against your anointed. So why aren't you what you claim to be? Why aren't you what you promised? Why haven't you kept your promise? And we see in that hymn that there's that protest there and that challenge there. You're using this hymn against God, in, in, in point of fact, how can this happen? And so it spells out what God should be doing and what he should not be doing and say, no, this is wrong, God. And there's uh, confronting God uh, with, how, with the way that he's been traditionally described uh, in a statement of praise. And so this is a, a helpful background to what we find in... Uh, uh, here in, in, in verse 19, and how this affirmation of faith is going to lead on to a sense of bewilderment, that why hasn't it been proved true? And that verse 18, it belongs to, uh, to uh, Zion theology. Uh, for instance, in, in Psalm uh, 42 and, uh, and, and, and verse... Uh, 48, rather, Psalm 48 and uh, verse 2. Uh, we, there's this celebration of Mount Zion, the city of the great king, the city of the great king, and God's kingship is celebrated as part of Zion theology. And then outside the, uh, the, the uh, song of particular songs of Zion, we find this, this Zionistic element uh, very much there. And Psalm 9, for instance, describes uh, God as enthroned in Zion. There we are, kingship related to Zion. That's the NIV, and that's now regarded as, as preferable to what the NRSV has, who dwells in Zion. No, Yahweh is enthroned in Zion. And uh, in, the, in, in the prophetic books, 
sometimes there, there are references to God who is eventually going to manifest his kingship in Zion in, in the future. Isaiah 24, verse 23. The Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Micah 4, 7. The Lord will reign in Mount Zion now and forevermore. And God's kingship is closely associated with the, with the temple. Six times in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is described as the place where Yahweh is enthroned on the cherubim, enthroned on the cherubim. And Psalm 99 in verse 1 says, The Lord is king, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. And it goes on to say that the Lord is great in Zion. And then too, in uh, Psalm 24, which may well uh, have originated in a, an ark procession, uh, so that the psalm is a, a, litany, a liturgy associated with an ark procession. Four times, it says in verses 7 to 9, it's the king of glory coming in, uh, represented by that ark of the covenant. And so it's a very dominant theme, this uh, question of d d divine uh, kingship and uh, and here as I say the, the, the affirmation of faith uh, in itself it's a protest it's an implicit protest and saying God you're not living up to those promises and to our general theological beliefs which functioned in our theology for, 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 for centuries what, what's happened how can this be uh, true And so, having formulated that, that, that challenge, that uh, ob objective challenge, they can now, in verse 19, they, they can now uh, bring out the nature of the problem, that uh, th th this doesn't cohere. Uh, we, 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 we do expect Zion theology to, to be in, in, in operation. You, you, you might say, well, we, we've had Zion theology uh, before in the, in, in, in the book, and we seem to be getting the argument that uh, it's an expectation that, that, that hasn't come true now, but part of grief is sometimes to tolerate that situation and realize that we need a new set of expectations, and that, in fact, the mentor had provided in chapter 3, going back to Exodus 34 and verse 6, with its sinister background of the worship of the golden calf, how sinister that story is, but saying there's a way back to God, there's this back door back to forgiveness and uh, acceptance. And indeed, in, in, chapter, in chapter 5, implicitly the congregation is uh, taking hold of that situation, and the mentor has said there's a need for prayer, uh, as the human side of your coming back and being accepted by God and the congregation accept that. But they haven't said no. They, 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 they haven't said a permanent no to that old expectation. And in a way, that's, that's what one might expect because if we look at uh, exilic prophecy uh, and at post-exilic prophecy, we find that there's a a return to, to, to Zion theology. And in what we call Second uh, Isaiah, which, which goes back to the, uh, seems to go back to the exilic period in, in Babylon, uh, in the context of the Judeans there in exile, uh, the, 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 there's very much a, a promise of, of a future for Zion. Uh, and so it, it's the cornerstone of, of the prophet's thinking. You're going to go back to Jerusalem, You're going to go back to Jerusalem and all will be well once more. And so that Zion theology is very much prized. And then too, in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 62, which now seems to be post-exilic, the whole chapter uh, is, is really a reaffirmation of Zion theology. And so both of, of those um, prophetic areas are saying you can hold on to Zion theology as a prospect for the future. And Isaiah 62, 
uh, says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. And that's only the first verse, but the whole chapter is devoted to a, a celebration in a predictive way of Zion theology coming to the fore once more and coming true again. And so we can say that um, the congregation is in good company in saying we really do expect uh, Zion theology to be in uh, operation and we expect you eventually to keep your, your promises. And this, there's this persuasive harking back uh, to God's kingship in the context of Zion theology and saying surely it ought to be in operation once more. But now we have this uh, protest, this explicit protest. Why have you forgotten us completely? Why have you forsaken us these, the, the, these many days? And uh, uh, here that, that, that word, uh, re remember, it, 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 it very, it, it, that word forgotten, it's the opposite of that word remember. Remember back in verse one meant to ignore. And so here, here again, don't ignore us, but this is what you've been doing. Why have you forgotten us completely? Why have you, why are you no longer uh, remembering us and uh, bearing us in mind and working out your, 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 these great traditions in, 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 our, in our lives? And so we, we have this, the prayer takes the explicit form of challenge here. And then the other verb, the other negative verb, why have you forsaken us these, these many days? The absence of God's presence in blessing and in salvation. And uh, all through the book, well, here and there through the book, in major parts, we've had an emphasis on the negative presence of God, God there punishing. There was one place in 356 where the mentor was concerned, where... He said, God, you heard my plea. You came near when I called you. You said, do not fear. But that's the only place where we have a positive presence. But there's this, uh, th there's this hope for this positive presence of, of, of God. And they cannot understand why it is that uh, it's not so. Psalm 22 is a, a prayer of protest and uh, challenge. And it begins in that forceful way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And my God, it spells out the relationship. And the expectation of that relationship it is that there should be that close bond of blessing and salvation. But over against that, my God, my God, but why have you forsaken me? It doesn't hang together, deliberately doesn't hang together, that my God should act in this uh, way. And so these are implicit petitions for God to do otherwise. It's time for God to reveal himself as the one who's Israel's God and on Israel's side and to show his royal power. What we need to see, we might say the congregation is being overbold here. How dare they speak of this? Uh, we speak like, like this in, in prayer. But what we've got to realize is that this is implicitly based on chapter 3 in, a, in, in various ways. And chapter 3 gives a warrant for the congregation's appeals and challenges in, in chapter 5. In three ways. First of all, chapter 3 had spelled out, the mentor had spelled out God's two-part plan. First, the Lord had to punish and then he was going to go on to save. First the bad, and then the good. And so this is the implicit plea, you might say, for good to happen. And then secondly, chapter 3 had pointed to the permanence of God's covenant love, God's steadfast love. And so underlying this challenge in process is what the mentor has assured them of. And so this makes them look to the future with an expectation of God acting differently and no longer acting in this negative way. And then thirdly, there'd been talk of this backdoor approach 
into God's acceptance once more after confessing sin. They confess their sin twice in this last poem already. And so now it was time to be accepted once more. And so, verse 21. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. There's something a bit tentative here uh, at the beginning of, uh, of verse 21. Yes, confession and repentance are necessary. Yes, uh, this human congregation have, have, have got to work out that, that human side of confession and re repentance. Uh, but it's not going to take the congregation all the way, but only part of the way. God needs to respond by restoring. We want to be restored, but it can only happen if God restores us. And this reminds me, I said I was going to come back to it. In chapter 3 and in verse 29 at the end there, there may yet be hope. There may yet be hope. And there was this element of contingency there. And there was this tentativeness there. And uh, one reason for it, we saw, was theological. It's up to God how he reacts. We can present strong, the strongest theological arguments, but we can't force God to do something, to do what we want. Not our will, but your will be done. But please do restore us. We do ask you to do it, please. But there's dependence upon God here. God has to react to these human actions, which are good in themselves, confession and repentance, but they're depending on the sovereignty of God. He can do it or he, he can not do it. But please do it. And it's like a, it's like a, 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 it's like an attorney in, in a court of law who will present the strongest possible uh, arguments on behalf of his and her client. But the judge and jury may decide otherwise. And so it's up to them. It's up to them. The attorney, attorney has to do the best he can, but ultimately it's up to the judge and jury to return the, vict the verdict that they think right. So restore us to yourself, O oh Lord, that we may be restored. It's not an automatic thing. I said before, God isn't a slot machine, but God, what do you want? What do you want? Are you going to answer? And so there's submission to God at this point and a recognition of God's sovereignty. And then it says finally, renew our days as of old. They, they want a spiritual restoration. Yes, they do, but they want with it an existential, uh, objective, p political, uh, all sorts of words one could use, an, an outward restoration uh, too. Uh, and that's what they want. Please bring things back to normal. Renew our days uh, as, as of old. And I get a bit more cautious about that prayer. It's the sort of prayer that everybody who grieves would want to make what they, they hope for. Take me back to normality again. Uh, but usually, that old normality is gone. Uh, in some respects, uh, d depending on what the grief is, in a, in a small way or in, in a big way. And there's going to be a, a new normal and the old normal has passed away. But grievers automatically think, I want the good old days to come back. But they won't necessarily come back. But that's a, a little element that the congregation would eventually have to uh, learn. And then finally, protest again. Unless you utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. And they end up with this challenge to, to, to uh, God. And we look for parallels for this in the 
psalms of lament that are challenges to God in, in the book of Psalms. And uh, we, we find it occurring all over the place. And sometimes uh, it's in the form of, of, of a question. Uh, I think of Psalm 74 and verse 1. It occurs in connection with this uh, uh, question, why? Why do you cast us off forever? Why do you cast us off forever? And it's taken as a fact. And there's this protest and challenge against it. Why have you rejected us uh, forever, O oh, oh, oh God? Sometimes it's not in the form of a question. It's in the form of an uh, imperative. And uh, we, 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 we find that in, uh, in Psalm uh, 44. Psalm 44 and verse uh, t t t 20... Uh, 23. I, I think I've got the, uh, the, the wrong reference at that point. Um, but the, 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 the text actually says, Do not reject us forever. Do not reject us forever. There, I think, somewhere in Psalm uh, 44. So it can happen as an imperative. But it, it can also occur uh, as a statement. And it seems to be, a, it is a statement here in verse 22 of Lamentations 5. And here uh, we go back to Psalm 89, that royal psalm of uh, complaint. And uh, in verse 38, But now you have spurned and rejected him, the present Davidic king. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have rejected him. And it's this statement uh, which is the, the, the parallel, the more exact parallel for this, uh, this double uh, challenge here. And this is the ultimate challenge in this particular psalm. And it's meant as a motivation for God to uh, anger, to, 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 uh, to answer and, uh, and, and, and change his, his, his negative purposes to positive ones inside. And to say, no, I haven't rejected you. I haven't rejected you utterly. No, I won't be angry with you permanently. And there's a, a fascinating parallel for that that brings that out in Isaiah chapter 49 and uh, verses 14 and 15. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. There we are, outside a, a, a challenging uh, uh, psalm of complaint. Um, we, we've got it in the prophetic context. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my God has forgotten me. And God answers, can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. And so the challenge is brought, the statement from Zion, the Lord has forsaken me. My God has forgotten me. And God says, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. And of course, this is the force of the challenge in all the Psalms of complaint and here in uh, Isaiah uh, 49. Uh, for 40, 40 uh, yes, it, it's actually uh, uh, 49, isn't it? 49, 14, and 15. And God says, no, not so. And it, it reminds me, we, we could have a think of a parallel in a human situation a couple who a married couple not getting on very well and uh, one of the spouses is suspicious of the other there seems to be some indication that he or she is in, is uh, interested in somebody else or he or she is so devoted to their work that the uh, his or her work that the other spouse is being ignored and there may be an, an outburst. You don't love me anymore. You don't love me anymore. That negative statement. And uh, there may be some objective evidence in the spouse's mind. But there's more to it than that. Because the expectation is that the other spouse will turn around and say, Oh, I do. Of course I love you. You must realize I've never stopped loving you. And this is the explicit context in Isaiah 49, and this is the implicit hoped-for context here in the end of Lamentations 5, 
unless you've utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure, the hope is that eventually there will come an answer, an answer to prayer and a response to God that says, oh, no, I haven't. And really, in the Old Testament canon, as we said earlier at the beginning, uh, making use of intertextuality, in Second Isaiah, we, we, we get prophetic texts that deliberately hark back to the negativity of lamentations and turns the language into positive affirmations on behalf of the exiles, that there is a future for them. They are going to go back home. And so uh, this, is, this is where we are. What, what sounds so, so negative has really got uh, a positive intent. And we could draw a parallel with the situation I think I referred to earlier when we were talking uh, in an introductory way about psalms of complaint. I made a reference to Mark 4, verse 38, where the disciples say, Don't you care? We're drowning. Don't you care that we're drowning? And Jesus was asleep. It, it was as if he couldn't care less. But in fact, what, what, what happened? Jesus woke up and stopped the storm. And he was virtually saying, of course I care. I won't let you drown. And there was that, this objective event that that happens of Jesus stopping the storm. But it was the equivalent of an affirmation of love and support for his disciples. And so, and, and then there's a further fact here. I said earlier that the congregation's prayer is dependent upon chapter three. The mentor has led the way. And specifically, the mentor has led the way in this matter of rejection because what did he say back in chapter 3 and verse 31? The Lord will not reject forever. Rejected you now, but the Lord will not reject you forever. And this is the basis for this challenge unless you've utterly rejected us. And they've got the mentor behind them with his affirmation, no, that's not true. But it looks like it. It looks so much like it. And they bring that challenge to God. Well, now, let's, in closing, think about complaint and protest and challenge brought to God in a more general way. We broached it in chapter 3 and in verse 39. And we were saying there, that verse said, why should any who draw breath complain about the punishment of their sin? You're survivors. You're survivors. You, you, you haven't died. There's already a hint of some prospect for you. God may well have good things for you in your future lives. So why should any who draw com breath complain about the punishment of their sins? There's something beyond punishment. But that word complain we fixed on. The only other case in the Old Testament was back in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1. And there it was an illegitimate claim and it brought forth punishment from God in, in point of fact. And we contrasted it with other examples in Exodus and in Numbers where there were legitimate complaints. We haven't got any food. We haven't got any water. Okay, I'll provide you with it. And those are, are, qu are quite rational. So there are complaints that Jesus that God, rather, accepts, and there are complaints that, um, that uh, God d d does not accept. And uh, here, this is, uh, this is an acceptable type of, of, of complaint, and uh, it's very much part of, of, uh, of, of the Old Testament. And we get that example in, in, in Mark uh, 4.38, and I think I mentioned some other examples when we were looking at it in an introductory way. But it's something that Christianity has abandoned, I think. And it sounds disrespectful. Oh, no, you don't talk to God like that. And it's the thing of, the thing of a pastor praying this sort of prayer. Oh, no, that's so disrespectful. Oh, no, God doesn't like that sort of prayer. Uh, and it's rather interesting. We looked at Mark's account of that storm at sea 
don't you care that we perish? Matthew and Luke have also got that same narrative, but they tone it down. The complaint is gone in Matthew and Luke. The protest is gone. And uh, this almost looks like a foretaste of what happens has happened in Christianity generally. Judaism has taken up uh, a complaint and, uh, and used it, especially in times of persecution. And uh, it, it occurs, complaint, protest to God occurs in rabbinic texts and uh, prayers. Uh, complaints get in, in, incorporated. There's uh, an interesting example in uh, Fiddler on the Roof, that Jewish story of persecution. No doubt many of us have seen the uh, play or seen the film. And uh, that poor milkman, his, uh, his horse gets lame and can't draw the milk cart. And the milkman has got to get between the shafts and pull the cart himself to deliver the milk to his customers. And he says, complaint is here, very much a Jewish form of complaint. Today I am a horse. Dear Lord, did you have to make my poor old horse lose his shoe just before the Sabbath? That wasn't in, in nice. It's enough you pick on me. Bless me with five daughters, a life of poverty. What have you got against my horse? Sometimes I think when things are too quiet up there, you say to yourself, let's see what kind of mischief I can play on my friend. And though that's presented in a humorous way, it is a challenge to God. And then uh, later on in the uh, script, he says, Dear God, did you have to send me news like that? Bad news. Today of all days. It's true, we are the chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose somebody else? And there we are. There's this... <laughs> There's that challenge there, and though there's, there's uh, humor there, uh, it's still a part of, of, of Judaism. And I think it's a reaction to persecution. And perhaps Christianity has given up uh, complaint to God because it hasn't had enough persecution. It's been the dominant religion uh, in, in its own areas, and it, it's held sway uh, over others. And our job is, is to evangelize, and we're the top dog, and we are to evangelize those who don't ag agree with, with, with us. And that, that, can, be, that can be not, not helpful. And sometimes persecution can help the church forward. And certainly the New Testament had that point of view, that there were benefits in persecution. And it was for, for, for Judaism. And it's true to the Old Testament, and we find it a few examples in the, in, the, in the New Testament. And so let's take this to heart. Next time, we should be looking at Lamentations from a Christian perspective. This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the Book of Lamentations. This is session number 14, Lamentations chapter 5, verses 17 through 22.